the coronavirus pandemic has disrupted our life in so many ways. Even for me, I just started to talk in physical conferences around the world in the end of the year of 2019. And all the physical conferences that came after has been canceled. And in this situation in life, you maybe can be sad. But from my perspective for life, we don't have time to be sad. Life are so short. And because of that, we always need to think about how to create a good situations from a bad ones. And this is exactly what I've done when the Corona pandemic has started. In the beginning, we have a lot more time to spend at home. And in the first few days, I was rearrange my apartment, move everything, change everything, open my sofa to a bed that sometimes I can sleep in my living room. The aquarium that didn't work for five years, I put some water and some fishes and everything to create a good mood to stay at home. And then came the first weekend of the lockdown that we cannot go out anywhere. And I thought to myself, what I will do with all this free time in the weekend? And I remember that several years ago, I created the pure CSS game, which is called Kill the Birds, that I don't know why so many web developers all around the world loved it so much. And I thought to myself that in the last several years, I learned so many new tricks in CSS that now I can create a lot better one. But I needed an idea of what it will be about. And it was one of the most easiest ideas that I had in my life. Because if we are now living in the coronavirus pandemic time, why not to create the coronavirus game? And this is exactly what I've done. I created this pure CSS game, which is called the Coronavirus Invaders. And everything that you are seeing right now is only built while using CSS and HTML. Yes, for the CSS part, I'm using CSS preprocessor. And even for the HTML part, I'm using an HTML preprocessor. But all the logic of this game, like when I'm clicking on this OMI button, the logic of the opening and the closing of the pop-up is done only while using CSS and HTML. And when I will click the save the world button, the play button of the game, it will hide the game navigation and it will open the game frame itself. Even that logic is done only while using CSS and HTML. And when I will click on some coronavirus creature, they will be disappear and the score of the game will go up. Even that is done only while using CSS and HTML. And what about the countdown? No, really, the countdown is built only while using CSS. But before you're writing any single line of code in your own project, you need to think about something that inspires you. And I don't know why I remember an old code pen that I saw in the middle of the year of 2019 that was painted on canvas HTML with these cute creatures that remind me a little bit the coronavirus creatures. And I needed to think about a name to the game and how to design the main navigation. And I don't know why I remember the chicken invaders game in my mind. And I took the invaders word and some other design ideas on how to design the main navigation. And when you are thinking about inspiration is always to take other older ideas and to create from them something else, something new. And the first thing that I wanted to create in my own game is to create the coronavirus creatures. And it's nice to see that this was my inspiration in the end, the coronavirus creature was looking different and I love it because this is my own coronavirus creature. And then I wanted to start to create the HTML of those coronavirus creature. And for me, the HTML is very important. It's not just to take HTML element and to throw them to an HTML document. No, this is an object of HTML of coronavirus creature and it's need to be very precise. Then I created this label HTML element with a class of coronavirus and inside I put an input type radio. And you may ask why I'm using here label HTML element and why there is input type radio inside. This is part of the logic of the game that we will talk about it a little bit later. But all the visual part of the coronavirus creature are starting here with this div class body. In the, the body, we have the 12 hairs and it's both eyes. But from the beginning, I saw that I have a lot of repetition in my HTML code, like to create those 12 hairs. And in the real game, I have 100 coronavirus creatures. And I didn't want to copy paste them one by one. And I needed to think of a way to solve this problem. 
And in my first time in my life, I'm using here an HTML preprocessor of Pug that give us possibility to do repetition in the HTML part in a more smarter way. And yes, for the CSS part, I'm using the CSS preprocessor of SAS that I'm using, I think, in the last 10 years for every one of my project. And now, instead of doing this repetition, for example, I can write it in Pug with wireballs, while loop, and to create the HTML more dynamically. And yes, Pug is being compiled to just regular HTML. But as you can see here, Pug is written very different from regular HTML. And if you are working with Pug, you cannot write half Pug and half HTML. If you are working with Pug, you need to write everything in Pug. And this means that I needed to update all the HTML code to the new Pug that uh, the way that is being written. And yes, you need to get used to it. But all this project I was creating in two days in the weekend, and I was learning Pug mean while I was creating this project. Because of that, everyone can learn Pug. It's really not so hard. And now I wanted to start to paint the visual part of the coronavirus creature. I started with the body. I gave it position relative. Why position relative? Because all the parts of the coronavirus creature need to be according to its body. The body got width and height of 100 pixel and background color black. And to get the circle shape, I just gave it border radius of 50%. And to create the all of the eyes and to select, if you remember the two classes of I1 and I2 together, I'm using here the attribute selector with the star character. This select me the both classes of I1 and I2 combined. And I gave them width and height, little bit different, background color white and border radius of 50%. Because the width and the height are a little bit different, with the border radius, it's getting the egg shape that is nice to get. To locate them, I gave both of them position absolute, top 25%, the left eye, I1, left 25%, the right eye, right 25%, and a little bit rotate Z to the inside. To create the inner part of the eyes, Without adding another HTML element, I'm using here the before pseudo element. And in the same way, with height, background color black, and border radius of 50%. And if you are looking what I created until now, it's just circles, circles, and circles. And to create the hairs of the coronavirus creature and to select all the classes, if you remember, between L1 until L12, again, I'm using here the attribute selector with the star character. These select me all those 12 classes of all those HTML elements. And to create those hairs, I'm creating them from two boxes that I'm creating with the before and the after pseudo element. The root of the hair is uh, the after pseudo element that I'm putting in the bottom. And the crown of the hair is another box that I'm putting up above. And to get the circle shape, I'm just giving it border radius of 50%. And to locate all those hair, first I gave all of them position absolute for all the hairs, and I locate them in exactly in the middle, in the center of the coronavirus creature, exactly here. And now one by one, I want to put them around the coronavirus creature. To do that, the first hair will get the transform property with a rotate Z value of zero degrees, that doesn't do anything, and the translate Y value with a value of minus 65 pixel, that taking the hair from the center to the top. But the second hair need to be top, but little bit to the right by 30 degrees. How I'm locating the second hair? Hair two will get the transform property, but now with a rotate Z value of 30 degrees and only then the translate Y value with a value of minus 65 pixel. In this way, the second hair will go top, but little bit to the right. And if you didn't know until now, the order of the value in the transform property are very important because they are affecting each other. And in this way, I just located all those 12 hairs of the coronavirus creature. As you can see here, different rotate Z value and the same translate Y value. But as you can see here, we have a lot of repetition in our code and we as web developers don't love to create repetition. How can we do it in another way? Because I'm working with a CSS preprocessor of SAS, in SAS, we can create a loop, or more precisely, I can create the SAS for loop. And this is exactly what I'm doing in the real game. First, I'm creating a SAS variable with the name of star position, and I'm giving it a value of zero degrees. Then I'm creating a SAS for loop that have another SAS variable with the name of i that is going dynamically between one to 12. 
in every one of the iteration, this creating me dynamically the CSS selector between L1 until L12. In every one of the iteration, the sus variable of stop position is getting bigger by 30 degrees. And I'm just putting this sus variable inside the rotate Z value inside the transform property. And in this way, I just now created you this CSS. Nice. But I wanted this creature to feel a lot more alive and I wanted to edit some animations, but I had a problem. Every one of those hairs that I wanted to do for the animation, every one of them have a different transform value. And if I want to move all those hairs, I needed to create a different animation for every one of those hairs. And because I didn't want to write them one by one, I just created all those animation in the same SAS for loop. In this way, I'm writing only one animation, but it's creating me dynamically 12 different animation for every one of those hairs. But I wanted this creature that it will feel a lot more alive and I wanted to add some animation for the eyes. And I added two animation for the eyes. One of the inner part of the eyes that they will move a little bit. And I wanted to create the effect that the eyes are getting closed. To do that, I'm using the second pseudo element of every one of the eyes the after pseudo element. And it's like a box. It has a width of 100%, height of zero pixel and background color black. And because it has a height of zero pixel, you don't see it. But in the animation of it, every five seconds of the animation, it's getting a height of 100%. And it's this way, the eyes are getting closed. Nice. But now let's continue for all the logic of the game, how this game is really working. And the first thing that you need to understand, it's how to separate it, all the logic of the frames that we have in our own game. And to do that, we will see the game, the game, and we will understand how I'm separating in my mind all the frames that I created for this game. The first frame, frame as you can see here, is the game menu frame. And this is the first frame that we need to represent in our HTML document. The second one is when I will click on the auto play button, it will open a pop-up. And this is another type of frame. And yes, we can put frame above other frames. The third frame in the same way, when I will click on the OMI, it will open another pop-up. And this is the third frame that we need to represent in our HTML document. The last frame is when I will click the save the world button, it will hide the game menu frame and it will open the game frame itself where we are playing the game. And this is our last four frame that we need to represent in our HTML document. How I'm representing all those frames in a very easy way, I'm just creating four separated section HTML element. And as you can see by the class name and by the, by, by the ID name, the first uh, frame is the game menu frame. The second one is the game frame itself. The third one is the frame of the pop-up of OMI. And the last one is the a pop-up of how to play. But when I'm loading this game, I want to see only the game menu frame. I don't want to see all the other frames. How can I hide all the other frames in a very easy way that everyone knows? I'm just giving all those other frames display none. In this way, when I'm loading the game, I'm only seeing the game menu frame. But now come the tricky part. I need to create some flags that they will tell me if something is open or something is closed. How can I create flags without using any JavaScript? If you are thinking about input HTML element of checkboxes, checkboxes are like flags, unchecked, false, checked, true. And this is exactly what I'm doing. I, I'm adding in the beginning of the HTML document three different checkboxes, three flags. And as you can see, I have here three checkboxes and every one of them have a specific ID name. And every one of them need to do for me different operation. The first checkbox that has the ID of Toggle game, if it's unchecked, this is mean that I want to see the game menu frame, but to hide the game frame. If it's checked, it's need to do the opposite, to show me the game frame, but to hide me the game menu frame. The two other checkbox are even more simple to understand. The first checkbox that has the ID name of how to play pop-up, if it's unchecked, I don't want to see the how to play pop-up. And if it's checked, please show me the how to play pop-up. The same way for the third checkbox that has the ID name 
of OMI pop-up. If it's unchecked, I don't want to see the OMI pop-up, but if you are checked, please show me the OMI pop-up. But those are just checkboxes that I'm putting in the beginning of the HTML document with opacity of zero, position absolute top minus something. You cannot see them and you cannot click on them. And now we need a way to trigger those checkboxes without clicking on them specific. How can I do it? To do that, I'm using a very old feature that exists from the beginning of the HTML. The game navigation button that you saw are not button HTML element. Instead, I'm using here a label HTML element that just looking like buttons. And label HTML element can trigger any input that you want with the for attribute that can be connected to a specific ID name of an input. For example, this save the world label button element is connected with the for attribute to the checkbox that has the ID name of Toggle Game. You see Toggle Game here and Toggle Game here. And if I will click this label button, it will trigger this checkbox and it will change the status from unchecked to status of checked. If you will click it again, it will change again from status of checked to unchecked. And as many times that you will clicking on it, okay? The same way for the two other label button, if I will click the label button of OMI, this one that has been connected with the four attribute to the checkbox with the idea of OMI pop-up, this one, I will click it one time, it will change from unchecked to check, you will click it again from check to unchecked, and as many times you will clicking on it. But this is just changing those statuses of those checkboxes. It still doesn't doing for me any operation in my own game. And now we need to use this status of those checkboxes to show or hide other frames of the game. And to do that, I'm using two special CSS features. The first feature is the check pseudo class. I can see if there is a specific checkbox that is in the status of checked. And if there is a specific checkbox in the status of checked, I can use the sibling selector to select any sibling element that come after, and I can give it display block, display none. And in this way, I can show or hide other frames in my game. And this is exactly what I'm doing in the real game. For example, when I'm clicking on the auto play label button, it will trigger the checkbox that has the ID name of how to play pop-up and it will change the status from unchecked to checked. If this checkbox is in status of checked, this selector will start to work for us. If this checkbox is in status of checked, go to the sibling element that has the ID name of how to play this is the real pop-up and just give it a display block. And in this way, now the pop-up is open. Nice. But now you need to ask yourself another question. How I'm closing the pop-up? And it's really the same idea if you're thinking about it. The X button and the close button again are not button HTML element. Again, there are label HTML element. And in this case of this specific pop-up, both a label have the for attribute that is being connected to the same checkbox, this one. And when this pop-up is open, this means that this checkbox is in status of checked. And when I will click on this label button that are being connected to the same checkbox, this will trigger the checkbox that was in status of checked. It will change the status from checked to unchecked. This selector will stop to work and we will get a display none that I was declaring in, declaring in the beginning and now the pop-up will be closed. Nice. But now you need to ask yourself another question. What is happening when I'm clicking the save the wall button, the play button of the game? When I'm clicking the save the wall button, the play button of the game, I need to do two operations instead of one. First, I need to hide the game menu frame, and then I need to show the game frame itself. How can I do two operations with one specific checkbox. And it's really the same idea if you are thinking about it. The checkbox that has the ID name of Toggle Game, if it's in status of checked, first go to the sibling element that has the class name of Game Menu Frame and give it display none. This way I'm hiding the Game Menu Frame. And after that, go to the sibling element with the class of Game Frame and give it display block. And in this way, I'm opening the Game Frame itself. And if you are thinking about it, I can do in this way as many operations that I want 
with one specific checkbox. Of course, this way of written is written with SAS. You can write it in two separated CSS selectors, but it's a lot more readable and easy to write it with SAS. Nice. But now let's jump for one of the most amazing tricks that I have in this game. Uh, when I'm clicking on those coronavirus creatures, they are being disappeared from the screen and the score of the game is going up. We actually have here two tricks that we need to talk about them. First, how when I'm clicking on those coronavirus creatures that are being disappeared. And the second, how I'm creating the CSS score that you're seeing right now when I'm clicking on those coronavirus creatures. Let's start first with the coronavirus creature. How is being disappear when I'm clicking on it? If you remember in the beginning, I told you that every coronavirus creature is a label HTML element that has input type radio inside. But I also told you that all the visual part of the coronavirus creature, it's this div with class of body. And what I'm doing in the real game, I'm doing animation for the label HTML element and move it around the screen just moving it. Because all the visual part of the coronavirus is inside, it's taking all the visual parts with it. And because if I'm clicking on the visual parts, it's like I'm clicking on the label HTML element because it's wrapped with a label HTML element. And because there is input type radio inside, it will automatically get trigger. In this case, I don't even need the for attribute and the ID name. And this is mean that I'm moving the label HTML element that moving with all the visual part on the screen. And when I'm clicking on the visual part, it's like I'm clicking on the label HTML element. Because the input type Roger is inside, it will automatically get trigger and it will change its status from unchecked to status of checked. This status is telling us that the virus is being dead. And now with this status, we need to hide the visual part of the coronavirus creature. This div with class body, yes. How I'm doing it, I'm just selecting every input type radio that is in the status of checked. Go to the sibling element with a class of body. This is the visual part of the coronavirus creature. And I'm just giving it opacity of zero. And in this way, you are clicking on those coronavirus creature and they are being disappeared from the screen. Nice. Now let's talk about how I'm creating the score of the game. To do that, I'm using a special CSS feature that it's called the CSS counters. Uh, in order to, to the CSS counter to work properly, you need to define it in the HTML document before all the input type radio that we have in our own game. The easiest place to define it, it's on the body HTML element. How you are defining a CSS counter? I'm just selecting the body HTML element and I'm using here the special property that's creating the CSS counter of counter reset. And here you can give this counter any name that you want. I gave it the name Corona. Now I need to count all those dead viruses. How I'm counting them, just selecting every input type radio that is in status of checked. And I'm using here the property of counter increment and increment the Corona value that I created here. In order to the print, uh, printing of the total score to work, you need to define it in the HTML code after all the input type radio. The easiest place is just to put it in the bottom of the HTML document. And as you can see here, I created this div with class of sum. The text score is coming here from here, but the total value need to be printed here after the, this text of score. To do that, I'm just selecting the class of sum using the after pseudo element that using the content property that using here the native CSS counter function that just printing me the Corona value that we incremented here and created here. In this way, it's always listening and printing the total score for the screen. Because it's a very complicated example, I want to show you this in a real live code demo and let's see it in CodePen. And as you can see here, I kind of created five coronavirus creature. As you can see, you can even see the input type radio. In the real game, it has opacity of zero. The visual part of the coronavirus creature, it's this div class body. This is the big black circle. The eyes and the hairs in the real game are here inside, okay? Just that we will know that. And a place to summarize the total score in the bottom, div class sum, the text score is coming from the HTML but the number, the value is coming from the CSS. 
To create the CSS counter, I'm selecting the body HTML element and using the property of counter reset and gave it the value, any value that I want, I gave it the name Corona. For every input type radio that is in the status of checked, counter increment me the Corona co uh, counter that I created in the top. Beside of it, if the input type radio is in, is in the status of checked, go to the sibling element with a class of body and give it opacity of zero. You see, if this input type radio will be checked, it will go to the sibling element and it will hide it with opacity of zero. Nice. And a place to summarize the total score, I'm just selecting the class of sum using the after pseudo element that will print me here, uh, the text with the content property with the native CSS counter function that just printing me here, the Corona value that I incremented here and created here. Let's see that it really works. I'm clicking on those coronavirus creature. The score is going up. You can even see the radio button is being checked. And in this way, I creating a pure CSS score for a pure CSS game. Nice. But now let's continue to another amazing trick. How I can create pure CSS countdown. Let's see the real code of this example. As you can see here in the HTML code, the numbers are not coming from the HTML. They are coming from a CSS animation that I'm doing on the content property. But I have here animation that's going only between nine to zero. But here the number is going between 99 to zero. What is really happening here? What I'm doing here, I'm doing two different animation for the first value of the number and the second value of the number. It's really like two separated strings that are really a good synchronize that you will understand exactly what you are seeing right now. Let's print in this pen HTML element, the text AA. And you will see that there's not any connection between those both numbers. There are two separated string that are really very synchronized. And let's understand how this CSS reset is really working. CSS uh, countdown is really working. As you can see here, I'm selecting the count pen HTML element. And I'm using here the before pseudo element. I now want to animate the before pseudo element. I'm calling the animation of countdown and I'm telling it to work for 100 seconds and one iteration. 100 seconds for a total of 10 frames between nine to zero. It's meaning that every 10 seconds it will go one number down, 20 seconds another, 30 seconds another. And after it finished the first iteration, because it needs to work only one iteration, I want it to be stuck on the last frame of the animation, the zero value. To do that, I'm just putting here the forwards value, the telling the animation when you are finished your only one iteration that you have, please be stuck of the last frame of the animation. This is for the first value. The second value is the after pseudo element. And now I'm using the same animation, but in a different way. I'm telling the animation now to work for 10 seconds and 10 iteration. 10 seconds for 10 frames, this means that every one second will go one number down, two seconds another, three seconds another. After the first iteration, it will work again for another nine iteration. Why? Because I declared here that I want it to work for a total of 10 iteration. And after all those 10 iteration, I want that the second value will be stuck on the last frame of the animation as well on the zero value. And to do that, I just put here the forward value that telling the animation after you are finished all your iteration, please be stuck on the zero value on the last frame of the animation. And let's see that it really works. Four, three, two, one, and finish. Nice. Let's continue to more cool stuff that I have in this game. Random values. First, I want to show you why I wanted to create random values. And let's open the link here again. And let's play this game again. And as you can see here, the location of the coronavirus creature is really randomized. Even the scale of it is being randomized. Even the rotation of it is being randomized. But wait a minute, how can I create random stuff in CSS? You can't, but you can do it with SAS. And you need to understand that every coronavirus creature have different location on the screen. And if you are thinking about it, this is meaning that I need to create 100 different animation for every one of those coronavirus creature. And because I didn't want to write them one by one, how I've done it, you can guess, and I will show you the real code here first that you will understand exactly how I'm doing it. 
let's see, put it here. And as you can see here, I have here a for loop that creating me working for 100 iteration and creating me dynamically this CSS animation for 100 times, 100 different animation for every one of those viruses. Every virus have six different location in the game. The translate X is always the same, but in the translate Y axis, I'm using here the sus random function that randomized me value between one to 80, and I'm just doubling it in one VH. Even for the scale, I'm using the sus random function, and even for the rotation, I'm using the sus random function. That you will understand exactly how this random function is working, I want to show you another example that is more simple to understand. Let's see here the HTML. Let's compile the pack that you won't be afraid from it. Just regular HTML element, six empty li HTML element, nothing special. The numbers that you're seeing inside, again, are not coming from the HTML. And again, they are coming from the CSS. And in the SAS code, what I'm doing, I done here a SAS for loop that is running six iteration and created me dynamically all the selector between class one to class six. And in every one of the iteration with the before pseudo element and with the content property, I'm now using here the SAS random function that randomizes me a value between one to 80, and I'm just doubling it in one VH. And all those numbers that you're seeing inside are really randomized. For you to believe me that they're really randomized, let's compile the SAS code again, and we'll see that they are changing. And to compile it again, I just need to press here, enter. And you will see that the numbers are changing. If I will do it again, they will change again and again. And as many times that I'm compiling the SAS code to the CSS, of course, that in order to those value to change, you have to compile the SAS code to CSS again and again and again. And that you will understand what is happening here because browser are reading only CSS. Let's see the compiled CSS. Nothing special, just regular CSS. In order to those value to change, you have to compile the SAS code again and again and again. Nice. Let's continue to our next thing. Uh, after 99 seconds of the game, I'm putting the game over curtain. And I wanted that the player can play this game again and again and again. But I had a problem. I understand that in order to do it, I need to reset all the checkboxes that was being checked to unchecked. In order to, to reset the CSS score, I need to reset all the radio button that was checked to unchecked. And I thought about a lot of way, how can I solve this problem? And I thought about an old feature that is existing from the beginning, I think, of HTML. This button of back to menu menu, it's not a label HTML element. In this case, this is a special button of input type reset. And in order to it to work, the only thing that I needed to do is just to wrap everything with the form HTML element. And when you are clicking on a reset button, an input reset button, it will automatically reset all your input that are inside the form HTML element. It will reset all the checkbox that was checked to unchecked. This will bring you automatically to the game menu navigation. And all the radio button that was checked will be unchecked. And this will reset the CSS score to zero again. And now you can play this game again and again and again. And the last question that you need to ask me, how can I know exactly when to put this game over curtain? I need to put it exactly after 99 seconds. And to do that, it's really the one of the most easiest tricks that I created in my own game. Everyone know that animation can get animation duration. This is telling the animation how much time it's need to, tie, to take from the start until the end. But what we are also forget that we have another animation duration, the animation delay duration, that telling the animation after how much time it's need to be start. In the real game, I have kind of a value of 99 seconds. For this example, I only put here five seconds that we don't need to wait so much. And let's see that it really works. Let's refresh the screen and we will count together between one to five, okay? I will refresh the screen and we will count together. One, two, three, four, and five. Game over. Nice, okay. We saw here a lot of CSS tricks 
that with them you can create pure CSS games. And maybe you think that this is the main key takeaway that I want you to take from this talk, but it isn't. The most important thing that I want you to take from this talk is to create your own fun project. It can be in CSS, it can be CSS games, it can be in JavaScript, it can be in every programming languages. And why it's so important to create projects only for fun, not for your company, not for your friends, only for yourself and only for fun. We as adults, we are starting to forget that the best way to learn new stuff is by playing. When we are young, we do it naturally. We are playing and we are learning new stuff. In the animal kingdom is the same. Small kitten, they are like hunting each other. They are playing, they're having fun. And when they are adult, they know how to hunt. But we as adults, we starting to learn things in the hard way, in the boring way. And it's very hard for us to learn new things. But when you are creating for yourself projects for fun, in the end, you will be a lot better web developers. You are enjoying, that is very important. You will get a better salary because you are getting to be a better web developer. And even this is not important. The most important thing in life is to have fun, create your own project because you can. And before we finish, my friend, I'm Elad Shechter. I'm CSS HTML architect. I'm doing a lot of stuff. And you can follow me via my Twitter. I'm only tweeting on CSS stuff that I'm doing. You can see all my other stuff in Medium, CodePen, my own website, GitHub. All of the things are in my own website. You can QR the slide here if you want. And thank you very much for listening.